game. I felt I owed it to the fans, really. They were the best times of my life here. And I just want to walk around that pitch at the end of the year, hopefully having kept them up. That's, what I'm, that's, that's my dream. And he did get them jumping for his first home game against fellow strugglers West Brom. Here's the one to There's a real chance here for Pompey. Slides in. Todorov is there and he scored. Portsmouth have the lead at Bratton Park on Harry Redknapp's return. Harry was back with a bang and smiles were back on the faces of the Fratton Park faithful. A look at the Premier League records show one side has made great gains over the past five years. Bolton's return to the Premier League in 2001 saw them battle against relegation for two seasons before transforming themselves into genuine Champions League contenders. The main factor in that is Big Sam. Allardyce's image can be misleading. He's one of the country's most progressive coaches. 18 points from 21 once again saw Bolton challenging the top four. If we commit to the next 19 games as we committed to the first 19 games, uh, that would, uh, in the norm, more seasons, take us into four spot to win a Champions League spot for the first time ever. Uh, and to actually get to it uh, would be major in terms of the, the consistent level of performance against all the other Premiership sides that have much bigger resources, much greater history, and in general much bigger football clubs than ours. Liverpool have been on a slow fuse at the start of the season, but by December, everyone was taking them seriously. Xavi Alonso had set them on a 12-game unbeaten run against West Ham. Having struggled for goals, they hit a rich vein of form. The Reds amassed 34 points out of 36, a club record run for the European champions. It lifted them from 13th to 3rd. Undoubtedly, though, 2005 was all about Chelsea. With an 11-point gap to second place, 2006 promised to be just as successful. Sunderland were in danger of being cut loose at the bottom, while Harry Houdini had another escape act on his hands on the south coast. Bobby Zamora's piece of individual brilliance against Birmingham won him goal of the month. Wayne Rooney helped United make it 17 points from 21 over the Christmas period. Rafa's run made him the main man again. The year ended on a sour note for Michael Owen. He limped out of the Newcastle game at White Hart Lane with a broken metatarsal bone, which kept him out until the end of April. Two thousand and five wasn't the greatest year for Arsenal fans, but they could always rely upon their mercurial striker to lift them. Thierry Henry's seventh season at Highbury also saw him become club captain, and by October he'd become the club's all-time top scorer. Against Blackburn, another record was broken. Henry, the hundred at Highbury in the Premiership for Thierry Henry. And away goes Andre! His second! Straight through the middle for Andre! It's the hat trick! It's 150 league goals! He is a living legend, Thierry Andre! Thierry Andre scores his 200th Arsenal goal! The new year also brought a flurry of transfer activity. Robbie Fowler undoubtedly cut the happiest figure, rejoining Liverpool on loan. Chris Sutton returned to the Premier League to bolster Birmingham's relegation battle. Two fresh faces at Old Trafford, Nemanja Vidic strengthened the centre of defence and left-back Patrice Evra arrived from Monaco. Southampton's teenage sensation Theo Walcott joined Arsenal. Dean Ashton provided more firepower to West Ham's attack. Danny Murphy beat the deadline by minutes to sign for Tottenham. It was wheeler dealer Harry Redknapp who stole the show at Fratton Park, though. Aided in no small part by the millions of new co-owner Alexander Geidemack, nine new players joined the ranks as Portsmouth attempted the great escape. By the end of January, Spurs have replaced North London rivals Arsenal in the top four. 
Wigan separated them, passports at the ready. Everton were glad to see the end to 2005, but were now on course for the top half. Newcastle, Villa and Borough all failing to meet expectations. Anton Ferdinand demonstrated his all-round ability with a wonder strike against Fulham, and he had more to celebrate by being named Player of the Month. Three wins and a draw saw David Moyes take the manager's award. February proved to be the turning point in Newcastle United's season. The statistics spoke for themselves. Come the end of January, 10 defeats from 22 games left the Magpies just four places off relegation and Graham Souness on the brink. It doesn't rain or pour, it thunderstorms on the Newcastle manager. That loss at Manchester City was a defeat too far for chairman Freddie Shepherd. The following morning, Souness was sacked. He'd only been in the job for 17 months, but in that short time in charge had spent over £47 million on players with little return. The club turned to youth team coach Glenn Roder, who was placed in temporary charge until the end of the season. His task was to steady the ship and get Newcastle away from relegation. The effect was immediate. I hope we can find a manager that um, allows the club to be called great because of results. So he's going to have to be someone that not only uh, builds a team, you know, and the team needs some, you know, does need some building now a manager that uh, can, can build a club as well. From Tyneside to Teesside and the pressure was mounting on Steve McLaren. Widely acclaimed as one of the country's brightest coaches, his talented team were failing to live up to their pre-season billing. 25 points from 23 games said it all. February saw the Riverside faithful at breaking point following a 4-0 home defeat to fellow strugglers Aston Villa. One fan's frustration boiled over. Ironically, this incident came just days after McLaren was voted the most successful manager in Middlesbrough's history. You don't get carried away when you, you're voted the best and you don't, um, you don't go under when you uh, get a season ticket thrown at you and everyone wants you out of the job. The success and the way the club's gone forward. Um, I'm sure you look and you say, well, the Carling Cup, two adventures into Europe. The highest ever finish that Burroughs had in the Premier League. Most goals scored in a season. You know, he's, uh, he's successful. The loss against Villa was their nadir. McLaren's response was simple. Borough needed to get back to basics. Seven days later, against the champions Chelsea, goals from Rockenbach, Downing and Yakubu consigned Jose Mourinho to his heaviest defeat since taking charge at Stamford Bridge. Borough had comprehensively beaten the top three teams in the country, yet hovered precariously above the relegation zone. Despite that slip, Chelsea still held a 15-point gap over Manchester United and Liverpool. Blackburn and Bolton ready to pounce if Spurs should falter. At the bottom, it was looking precarious for Portsmouth, now eight points adrift of safety. Sunderland already were almost certainly doomed. Cristiano Ronaldo's scorcher against Portsmouth won goal of the month. Bolton's free-scoring midfielder Kevin Nolan picked up the Players Award. West Ham's 100% record did the trick for Alan Pardew. The moment of the month belongs to Blackburn Rovers' David Bentley. He celebrated his permanent move from Arsenal with a hat-trick. It was the first against Manchester United since Dennis Bailey's for Queen's Park Rangers in 1992. It helped Rovers to a 4-3 win and a domestic double over their Lancashire rivals. Misery for all three Premiership managers in the North East. Graham Souness had been shown the door at Newcastle, Steve McLaren was fighting to keep his head above water, and Mick McCarthy's Sunderland remained rock bottom. They'd been there since October and were resigned to relegation with two months of the season remaining. It had been a wretched campaign for McCarthy's men with only two wins in 27 games and a miserly 10 points. 
March saw yet another inept display against Manchester City. They conceded twice in two minutes, signalling the end of the road for McCarthy. His three-year tenure at the club was severed. At the other end of the table, Chelsea had gone about their business in a workmanlike, even somewhat reserved manner. March proved a turning point in their season, and perhaps in the way they were perceived in the country. 18 points clear at the summit of the Barclays English Premier League, it was a case of not if, but when they would retain their championship. But Mourinho's invincibles were humbled at home by Barcelona in the Champions League. And the following Saturday, they travelled to the Hawthorns for a fiery encounter. They did pick up three points against West Bromwich Albion, but no praise for the special one. He and his players were vilified in the press for being ungracious and unsporting. Their exit from the Champions League came soon after. Chelsea out of Europe and in danger of losing the respect of the nation. Defeat in the new Camp was followed by a trip to another fortress, Craven Cottage. Fulham had been in devastating form at home and sensing the blue half of West London was ruffled, Chris Coleman's side saw their chance. Towards Steve Malbrock, he just got it caught under his feet. It still might be a chance. It is, and Luis Malmorte gets the goal that Fulham were looking for. Fulham's first win over their rivals in 27 years, and one that almost guaranteed them safety. It was Mourinho's first defeat in the capital. The Blues were still nine points clear, but beginning to sweat. Arsenal, Blackburn, and Spurs were the main contenders for the fourth Champions League spot. On the south coast, Harry Redknapp had been in charge for three months, but there have been few signs of a Pompey recovery. Eight points short of safety with 11 games to go, looked too big a gap even for Harry. His new signings had failed to gel. Then, against Manchester City at Fratton Park, things began to click into place. Pedro Mendes is the man. A week later.